Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the disaster of the Kursk K-141 submarine. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, disturbing tales of survival, maiming, and graphic descriptions of death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before we begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. Today there will be some terms in the Russian language in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. Just a quick note here before we get started. The information on the submarine isn't always clear and is muddled in a bit of controversy and mystery, so we're going to be going off of the research that I could find, and I'll let you know when anything is a bit murky. Now that we have the housekeeping out of the way, K-141 Kursk was a Project 949A class anti-submarine of the Oscar class. It was known as Oscar II when using its NATO reporting name, which are code names given by NATO for military equipment from Russia, China, and the Eastern Bloc historically. It's mostly to give us unambiguous and easily understood English words in place of their actual names, but today we will be referring to her as either K-141 Kursk or simply the Kursk. She was the penultimate submarine of the Oscar II class that was approved and designed in the Soviet Union by Igor Spassky. Construction on the submarine first began in 1990 at the Soviet Navy military shipyards in Severodinsk in the Northern Russian SFSR, or Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, near Arkhangelsk. While the Kursk was being built, the Soviet Union collapsed completely in 1991, but the work on the submarine continued regardless of the political upheaval. She was one of the first naval vessels finished after the collapse of the Union, and in 1993, K-141 would finally be named the K-141 Kursk after the Battle of Kursk, since it was the 50th anniversary of this battle. If you're like me, you might be scratching your head and thinking, what is the Battle of Kursk? So I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of what happened. During World War II on the Eastern Front, the Nazi German forces and the Soviet Russian forces engaged in a tug-of-war military engagement in the city of Kursk in Russia. It was part of Hitler's plan to march through Russia, and the fighting went from July 5, 1943 to August 23, 1943. It was the largest tank battle in history, and ultimately the Soviets were victorious. So this was the battle that the submarine would gain its name from, and they were proud of their latest naval innovation. The submarine was inherited from the Soviet Union by Russia and launched in 1994, though we don't have an exact day. She was commissioned by the Russian Navy on December 30, 1994, as part of the Russian Northern Fleet, being assigned to her home port in Vedevelo, Murmansk Oblast, which is located on the Kola Peninsula north of the Arctic Circle. Surrounding this area is the Barents Sea in the north and the White Sea in the south and east. Due to the Gulf Stream on one side and the Arctic cold fronts on the other, the climate is harsh and unstable here with sharp temperature changes, high winds, and abundant precipitation, usually in the form of heavy snow. This harsh environment is where the Kursk would thrive. Let's talk about Kursk's design. The anti-design represented the highest achievement of Soviet nuclear submarine technology, and they are still the second largest cruise missile submarines ever built. The first largest are the American-made Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. The K-141 Kursk was designed to defeat an entire United States aircraft carrier group alone. For reference, the average U.S. aircraft carrier is typically between 1,050 to 1,100 feet long and displaces around 100,000 tons. And in a group, there's usually one aircraft carrier, two cruisers, three destroyers or frigates, and one auxiliary ship in these groups. That's a lot for one submarine to handle. 
One single Type 65 torpedo carried a 990-pound warhead powerful enough to sink an entire aircraft carrier. And both torpedoes and missiles could be equipped with nuclear warheads, so that submarine could definitely pack a punch. At 505.2 feet long, she was 30 feet longer than the previous Oscar I class of submarines. The submarine displaced 13,400 to 16,400 tons. She had a beam of 60 feet wide and a draft of 29.5 feet tall, with the outer hull being made of high nickel, high chromium stainless steel that was one third of an inch thick. This mixture had an incredibly good resistance to corrosion and a weak magnetic signature, making it difficult to detect by U.S. Magnetic Anomaly Detector or MAD systems. A magnetic anomaly detector is an instrument used to detect minute variations in the Earth's magnetic field and is typically used to detect submarines. Between this layer on the outer hull and the 2-inch thick steel pressure hull was a 79-inch gap. The submarine was designed to remain submerged for a maximum of 120 days, with the sail superstructure reinforced to be able to crunch through thick Arctic ice with ease. Her test depth was between 980 and 1640 feet by various estimates. It was propelled by two OK-650B OK nuclear reactors powering two steam turbines running two seven-bladed propellers that could propel her to speeds of 32 knots while submerged and 16 knots while surfaced. Her complement featured 68 enlisted submariners and 44 officers. As for her armaments, she was armed with 24 SSN-19-P700 Granite cruise missiles, which is a Soviet anti-ship cruise missile. In the bow, there were eight torpedo tubes. Four of them were 21 inches and four were 26 inches to launch the Granite missiles, which could travel a maximum range of 340 miles and were capable of supersonic flight at altitudes over 12 miles. These granite missiles were designed in order to be able to swarm enemy ships and choose individual targets, finishing with a dive onto the target. The torpedo tubes in the submarine could be used to launch the granite torpedoes or anti-ship missiles with a range of about 31 miles, with 18 SSN-16 Stallion anti-submarine missiles being part of her armament. Kursk was part of Russia's northern fleet, which had suffered funding cuts throughout the 90s, with many of its submarines being anchored and rusting in the Sapadnya Litsa naval base, roughly 62 miles from Murmansk. During this time, there was little to no work to maintain anything except the most essential frontline equipment, and this included neglecting the search and rescue equipment. Northern Fleet sailors also went unpaid during the mid-1990s, which is just insanely sad. As for her Navy career, there really isn't one. There wasn't enough funding for fuel at the time, so she only completed one mission. She was deployed to the Mediterranean Sea for six months during the summer of 1999 to monitor the United States Sixth Fleet that was responding to the Kosovo crisis. The Kosovo War was an armed conflict in Kosovo, which was then part of Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Albania, where the Kosovo Liberation Army, a rebel group, controlled the area. The conflict resolved in March of 1999 when NATO began using airstrikes on the area, resulting in the Yugoslav forces withdrawing. Kursk was monitoring what the U.S. was doing there, and being this was her only mission she completed, her crew spent little time at sea and was pretty inexperienced, which is not safe when having to operate such a massive and powerful submarine like the Kursk. On August 10, 2000, Kursk joined the Summer X Naval Exercise, which was the first ever large-scaled naval exercise that was planned by the Russian Navy. The exercise included the Northern Fleet's flagship, the Kirov-class battlecruiser Pyotr Veliki, which translates to Peter the Great. It also included four attack submarines and a flotilla of smaller ships. The crew of Kursk had recently won a citation for its excellent performance, and they'd been recognized as the best crew of submariners in the Northern Fleet, which is significant for only having one mission. While Kursk was participating in an exercise, it loaded a full complement of combat weapons and was one of the few vessels that had been authorized to do so at all times. 
On the first day of the Summer X exercise, Kursk was armed with granite missiles filled with dummy warheads, and during test launching, she was successful in launching one of these missiles. Two days later, on August 12, 2000, Kursk prepared to fire two dummy torpedoes at Pyotr Veliki, the crew readying for possible future battles. Both of these dummy warheads had essentially blanks loaded in them, the dummy warheads containing no explosives, but they were manufactured and tested at a much lower quality standard than the typical warheads. At 11.28 a.m. local time, which is 7.28 a.m. universal time, there was an explosion while readying to fire the dummy projectile. According to the Russian Navy's final report after the disaster, the explosion was due to the failure of one of the hydrogen peroxide fueled Type 65 torpedoes, since they were manufactured to such a lower quality. A subsequent investigation to this finding reported that high test peroxide, also known as HTP, seeped through a vault weld in the torpedo casing. HTP is a highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide that was used as a propellant for the dummy torpedoes, and when it comes in contact with the catalyst, it expands rapidly by a factor of an astonishing 5,000. Because of this rapid expansion, massive amounts of oxygen and steam are produced in a small amount of time, with the pressure being produced by the expanding HTP causing a bigger problem in the submarine. This pressure ruptured the kerosene fuel tank in the torpedo itself and set off a massive explosion that was equal to about 220 to 550 pounds of TNT. After the explosion, the Kursk rocketed to the bottom of the sea that was relatively shallow at 354 feet. The submarine was roughly 84 miles off Severomorsk, which is now a closed town and main administrative base of the Russian Northern Fleet in Murmansk Oblast, Russia. 135 seconds after the first explosion rocked the submarine, a second explosion ignited that was even larger. It was equivalent to lighting off three to seven tons of TNT essentially inside of a big tin can. The explosions blew a massive hole in the hull and caused the first three compartments of the sub to completely collapse, instantly killing or incapacitating 95 of the 118 men manning the submarine. The submarine had eight watertight compartments, and the rest of the 23 survivors rushed to the last two of them, shutting the watertight doors behind them. For now, they were still alive. And this is where an insane and tragic story of survival begins. Among the survivors was a man by the name of Dmitry Kolonyskikov, and he was the captain lieutenant of the submarine. When the explosion went off in the submarine, he was in the seventh compartment, which was the engine room. They felt the sub jolt to one side, and he stood and told his men to follow emergency protocol. So they sealed the watertight doors to the seventh, eighth, and ninth compartments. Smoke was coming in the ventilation ducts, and the submarine pitched as they tried to surface, except it was too late. The second explosion happened, and it killed pretty much everyone in the front of the submarine. It shook everyone up from the sixth compartment back, but they were still alive. The Kursk sank like a stone, slamming bow first into the ocean floor, the st stern slapping the sand shortly afterward. They had enough power to have light and some amount of air because of the still functioning air purifiers. Despite protocol stating not to do so, Kolesnikov opened the door between the 6th and 7th compartments as survivors in the 6th compartments were pounding on the door and pleading for help. In this compartment, there was rapid flooding and the fire in the submarine raged. They all retreated backward into the 9th compartment as the flooding worsened. The watertight walls of the submarine punctured by flying shrapnel from the explosions. Here, they were trapped and they knew they were going to die unless they were rescued. Kolesnikov despite being in the worst situation possible and facing certain death, remained calm and took out a note. On this note, he wrote the date and time, as well as a brief description of what had happened. He listed himself and the other 22 men trapped here, stating they were the only ones left after the second explosion. In the note, he discussed also how they considered going through the escape hatch, but it didn't work probably because of the pressure pushing against the hatch 354 feet down under the surface of the Arctic Ocean. He folded up the note and put it into his shirt pocket, sitting in the submarine for the next hour and a half as the power went out. There was absolutely no light, and it was now dark, rapidly flooding, 
rapidly cooling because there was nothing to regulate the temperature and oxygen was running out. At this point, the men knew they were going to die, and Kolesnikov leaves another note stating he was riding blind and that he thought he was going to die. He wrote a loving, thoughtful, and heartfelt message to his wife and family. In closing, he told them not to despair and signed his name. Shortly after this, he and the other men sat for an unknown amount of time until they passed away. Some experts state that the Kursk would have completely flooded roughly eight hours after the explosion, so their deaths were excruciating and drawn out, and there was most certainly enough time to have rescued these men. The British and Norwegian navies offered their assistance, but the Russian navy initially refused any help. As we know, unfortunately, all 118 men of the Kursk would pass, some dying excruciatingly slow and painful deaths as they drowned, burned, or suffocated. The Russian Admiralty initially told the public that the majority of the men aboard the Kursk died within a few minutes of the explosions, but on August 21, 2000, Norwegian and Russian divers dove the 354 feet down to the wreck and found 24 bodies in the ninth compartment, which was the turbine room at the stern of the vessel. Kolesnikov's note naming all 23 sailors who were still alive was found in the compartment, stating that they were alive when the submarine sank. It's just so tragic to know this man and the other crew they knew they were going to die and never see their families, but wanted to be identified, and so they left their names to be discovered. On the Kursk, there was a potassium superoxide cartridge of a chemical oxygen generator, and these are used in order to absorb the carbon dioxide that sailors exhaled and chemically release oxygen during an emergency situation. However, because of the damage done by the explosions, it became contaminated by salt water, and this resulted in a chemical reaction that caused the flash fire, consuming the available oxygen. The investigation found to be true what we covered earlier, that the crew were able to avoid the fire by diving briefly into water that was leaking into the compartment due to the fire marks left on the bulkheads that indicated the water was at about waist height at the time. Unfortunately, most of the remaining crew did burn to death or suffocate, which is a horrifying way to die. At the time of the sinking, Russian President Vladimir Putin was immediately informed of what happened to the Kursk, but was assured by the Navy that they had everything under control and a rescue was already underway. Before you think, okay, he's doing all he can with the information he has. That could possibly be true, but he was on holiday at a presidential resort in Sochi on the Black Sea, and he waited five days before receiving no word and ending his vacation to return to Moscow. He was only four months into his presidency, and because of his lack of action, the public and media were rightfully very critical of him. His highly favorable ratings dropped dramatically because of his decision to stay at the resort. His response to the disaster was callous, and the government appeared ignorant and incompetent. A year after the disaster, he was quoted as saying, quote, I probably should have returned to Moscow, but nothing could have changed. I had the same level of communication in both in Sochi and Moscow, but from a pre-R point of view, I could have demonstrated some special eagerness to return. Well, to me that says, I could have cared more about those 118 sailors, but I didn't. But I'll let you guys decide that. If you would like to see Putin's interview about the curse with subtitles in English, there will be a link in the description. And that goes for all of the Russian government during this crisis, including the Navy, not just Putin. As for the salvage and recovery of the submarine, a consortium formed by the Dutch companies Smit, International, and Mamoet was awarded a contract by Russia to raise all of the vessel except the bow. They modified a barge called Giant 4, and it raised Kursk, recovering the remains of the 24 sailors trapped in compartment 9. During these 2001 salvage operations, the team first cut the bow off the submarine by sawing through it with a tungsten carbide studded cable. However, this had to be done very carefully. The sparks that came off this cable while sawing could ignite the remaining pockets of reactive gases like hydrogen and cause another explosion. Most of the bow was abandoned, with the rest of the Kursk being towed to Severomorsk and placed in a floating dry dock to be analyzed. 
The remains of the reactor compartment were then towed away to Seda Bay, where more than 50 reactor compartments were afloat at pier points, after a shipyard there had removed all the fuel from the submarine in early 2003. Some of the torpedo and tube fragments from the bow were recovered, and the rest of them were all destroyed using explosives sometime in 2002. There are rumors of a government cover-up, but I cannot substantiate them myself, so I will leave it at that. As for the inquiry into the sinking, it was found that the Navy's oft-stated conclusion that the submarine had collided with a foreign naval vessel and sank was found to be incorrect. A report was issued by the government that stated the disaster was caused by the HTP in the torpedo leaking through the welding and igniting. The report also found the initial explosion was what decimated the torpedo room compartment and killed everyone in the first compartment. The blast entered the second and maybe even the third and fourth watertight compartments through air conditioning vents. All of the 36 men posted in the command posts located in the second compartment were immediately incapacitated by a blast wave from the explosion, some if not all even possibly being killed by it. The first explosion caused a fire that significantly raised the temperature of the compartment to a scorching 4,890 degrees Fahrenheit, the heat causing the warheads of five to possibly seven other warheads to detonate, creating a massive explosion that measured 4.2 on the Richter magnitude scale on seismographs all across Europe. It was even detected as far away as Alaska, more than 3,000 miles away. Though that is the most logical and the official finding for the sinking, we do have to discuss an alternative explanation proposed by Vice Admiral Valery Ryansentiv. He disagreed with the official explanation, stating that inadequate training, poor maintenance, and incomplete inspections of the torpedoes caused the crew to mishandle it. As we know from earlier, they had only completed one mission, and so I could feasibly see this contributing to the official explanation. During the examination of the wreckage, investigators recovered a partially burned copy of the safety instructions for loading HTP propelled torpedoes, but these instructions were for a vastly different type of torpedo and failed to include some essential steps for testing an air valve on the torpedo. As well as this compelling evidence, the 7th Division 1st Submarine Flotilla never inspected K-141 Kursk's crew's qualifications and readiness to fire HTP-propelled torpedoes. The crew had absolutely no experience with these dangerous weapons and had not been properly trained in the least in handling or firing them. So, Ryan Sensev concluded that due to their inexperience and lack of training, Compounded by the major oversight and overlooked inspections, and because of the Kursk's crew trying their best with the incorrect instructions they had, all of this is what set off the tragic events that the official inquiry found. I personally believe it is a mix of the two conclusions, and that both are more than likely to be correct, and it's just a tragedy that there was so much incompetence that led to the deaths of so many. This episode hopes to remember those lost on the Kursk. They were loyal men simply following orders who were ill-prepared and paid the price for it with their lives. They deserved so much better. Our hearts go out to their families, and we hope to honor them by sharing their stories. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of SS Princess Louise, a pocket liner that became a floating restaurant before she met a tragic end. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.